Hello, I'm Gideon Burton. I want to give a short introduction to the novel in the 18th century. First off, I'd like to start by explaining many of the different cultural contexts out of which the novel as a new literary genre emerged. First of all, we have to understand the political situation in Britain. Britain was an emerging empire. It had a lot of uh, exports and imports from the distant colonies, a lot of uh, naval power and continuing exploration that was going on. Uh, this is a period of the uh, restoration of the, the monarchy and a, a new period of prosperity uh, after many years of the Civil War and its aftermath in the 17th century. As we move into the 18th century, uh, Britain is getting on its feet again. It's becoming a little bit more modern politically. Uh, it isn't quite to the, the state of, of democracy, uh, but you're starting to have de democratic ideas and ideals that are starting to be uh, talked about in the public sphere. And there's a lot of urbanization going on. London is becoming a, a real uh, a powerhouse in, in Europe and a, a great center of trade. At the same time, there are a lot of concerns with order, with reason, and with method. And, and the reasons for these concerns are various and coming out of different uh, places, out of the concern with the political and religious unrest that had been there for the prior century, but also now with the rise of science, and, and an effort to put things onto a more sure footing as far as um, um, how, how do we argue from reason. Uh, nature becomes a very key term at this period of time and, and for two very distinct kinds of reasons. First of all, nature is understood from a more scientific viewpoint as something that's objective. It's something that's out there. It's, it's exterior and it's impersonal. But at the same time in the 18th century, there was also an increasing attention on, on the inner life, on the mind, on psychology, on a subjective reality. This is coming out of Descartes and his Cogito Ergo Sum, I think, therefore I am, also out of Enlightenment skepticism and other things like that. So at the exact same time in this period, you have both an effort to push outside of the boundaries of the self, to ground reality in empirical exterior ways, and then also this way, this, this way, um, effort to ground reality on what is personal. So these, these are kind of diametrically opposed but um, simultaneous phenomena regarding nature. A term that I think is useful is experimental, and I'm, I'm drawing a bit from the French etymology of experimenté, which means someone that is experienced. And we can, we, <clears throat> in English, we understand the word experimental to relate more to science and the whole empirical effort to measure uh, natural phenomena and to control them somehow. So that's there, but also I'm, I'm wanting to suggest that um, the, the personal sense of experimental is there, that, it, that um, reality is coming out of personal experience. So what I'm talking about here is that the novel is coming out of a, a kind of stereo kind of um, view about reality or of nature that draws both on this outer and this inner variety of grounding reality. Uh, now, a lot of, the, of what's going on culturally in the 18th century has to do with Enlightenment values. They, they're really rich in France and make their way over to uh, England and, and over to America as well. And these values have to do with um, uh, freedoms, especially personal freedoms, individualism, uh, the personal point of view. And also, Enlightenment <coughs> has a lot to do with, with pushing back against any kind of dogmatism or authoritative system. We think, for example, about the French and, and Bastille Day and pushing back against the aristocracy. But this is happening not just in the political sphere, but almost in every other sphere that you can talk about. Anywhere there, where there is central authority, um, th there is this pushback against that to say, well, wait a minute, what are the first principles that are really operative here? And let's just not take it on the basis of uh, tradition. Now, part of the Enlightenment values had to do with um, not just of personally valuing things, but, but also, or personally knowing things, but also an increased sense of um, uh, public participation. And this had a lot to do with the rise of the popular press and what uh, some have called the public sphere. So some thinkers of the Enlightenment uh, believe that there was an emerging republic of letters that would transcend the national boundaries and, and would be more of a a um, not a, a politically identifiable republic 
but one that's a, an abstract republic made up of, of talent and of intellect. And this was made possible because of the, the rise of the printing press and um, the scientific journals and the popular periodicals and also a lot of other cultural institutions that were coming up that allowed for people to have public discussions about public matters. So this means everything from journalism and newspapers that would be discussed in the local coffee house culture or, or libraries, debating societies. More and more people had the opportunity to become part of their public world and of course this lays the groundwork for many democratic uh, processes, um, these ideals of being able to communicate across distances, debate across um, different ideologies and, and different um, parties and, and uh, factions, that there could be a kind of marketplace of ideas and that people could um, derive their, um, their political opinions and the way they govern themselves and, and the public uh, through some sort of ongoing public conversation. This sometimes split itself between a more elitist sort of republic of letters and then a kind of more uh, populist grub street. And so we see simultaneously the, the emergence of a more um, uh, elite kind of um, publishing. Where I'm thinking about the scientists and, and people like Alexander Pope and, and, and others who were the, the grand figures of the Republic of Letters. Um, but also we're, we see at the same time this populist press where people are publishing almost anything that, that they want. Um, it, it was not the case that there was universal democratic access to the printing press, but there was certainly a lot more than there ever had been before. And so you had this new range of people who are, are participating in getting their ideas circulating, and not just the intellectuals and, and the thought leaders of the day, but also uh, women and uh, people from uh, lower social classes, and just simply a greater diversity of people that are contributing to this concept of a public sphere. All right, so it's within these cultural contexts that we can understand then the emergence of the novel in the 18th century. Now, when you're talking about creating art for hundreds if not thousands of years, the traditional way of creating art or literature was to be derivative. It wasn't to come up with something new, but to draw from the classical canon of established works. So you had the, the classic genres such as the epic or, or tragedy or poetry and you had the, the great figures from ancient Greece and from ancient Rome who were the, the, the models that everyone looked to and if you were going to write anything if you're going to compose something for the theater it really needed to come from these ancient authors both in terms of the content and in terms of the genre or, or the form so let me show you an example of how that has played out over time, a very simple example. The Trojan War, a matter of legend that goes back well before Homer, but Homer is the one that most famously codifies the idea of the Trojan War. Um, and so that, that's many hundred years uh, BC. We have the composition of the, of the Iliad. You, the same story is also told by Euripides in one of his plays. And then hundreds of years later, we have Virgil, around the time of Christ who composes the, the Aeneid and of course that's a spin-off story of uh, Troy who escapes uh, from uh, of Aeneas who escapes from Troy and uh, has his own adventures. Uh, many hundreds of years after that we have in, in late medieval England Chaucer who composes a story that's also based on a love story that's based within the, the Trojan War, his Troilus and Crusade and then Shakespeare uh, after Chaucer will take his turn in the Renaissance creating his play Trilis and Cressida. Uh, later in the Renaissance we have Milton. He's not doing in subject matter uh, imitating the, the, the content of the Trojan War but he is taking a lot of the epic genre directly from the, the Aeneid or from Homer and customary ways of, of uh, presenting material from the epic genre he is, he is uh, putting into his Paradise Lost. Now when we come up to the 18th century and in what is sometimes known as the neoclassical period, we do have people who continue to imitate the, the classical literary canon, such as Alexander Pope, albeit in a parodic way. He imitates um, Homer or, or Virgil in composing his The Rape of the Lock. Now this, um, these, these uh, two literary periods, the Renaissance and the neoclassical period, are both referring to classical literature. The Renaissance was the rebirth 
of classical literature and all of the culture that, it, that went around that. And neoclassical means you know, a return to the classics again, but in a little different way. And so we still have this, this ongoing tradition very, very proximate to other things going on in the 18th century, but it is a contrast when we come to the novel, something that is quite different than this rebirth of classical literature as the standard of all things literary that happens in the 18th century. So it's helpful to understand that the word novel actually means new, and by new it's pushing back against this longer, excuse me, this, here we go, this longer tradition of being derivative. It's no longer derivative. It's going to be um, um, content that relates to the time period and the cultural and historical context of the 18th century. So even though there may be the occasional historical novel, that's not really the mainstream of it. The novels were set in contemporary England and its, and its uh, surroundings. It was also novel or new in terms of having new audiences. Uh, literature has always been a bit of an elitist enterprise and now due to the popular press and the fact that you can have thousands of copies of novels that can be printed at the same time you suddenly have many new and, and varied audiences that are reading this new literary genre. This includes women who for the first time are, are becoming authors and uh, readers and and the subjects of novels on a large scale. There's, there have always been female authors and readers and subjects, but this takes on a, a great new emphasis in the 18th century as women become the focus of, of attention and as topics of, of literary expression, uh, but also as those who are authoring literary works and becoming a, the mainstay for the novel as a, a big portion of the readers of this genre. Um, the novel is new also in terms of it having a loose structure, whereas the classical literary um, genres had very strict rules. Uh, the neoclassicists really liked those rules, um, but you had rules like the, the classical unities that constrained, uh, for example, there was a unity of time um, and things had to take place within 24 hours. In, in the novel, you had a much looser structure. Time especially was played with a great deal. Not only could things take place across many different days or even years, but there's a great um, fluidity with using time and jumping around in time, which is not completely novel. Within in the uh, epic, for example, you have a lot of playing with time, but it became a real mainstay of the, the novel as a genre that, that time would be played with a lot. Um, it was also very experimental, and I put that in quotes to refer to both sense of experimental that I talked about earlier. So. Uh, the novel is experimental in, in terms of its playing. It's like a laboratory of prose and narrative and expression. And let's see, let's see if this will work. And let's see if that'll work in terms of um, different plot lines or different types of protagonists or different types of formal structures, as I'll talk about in a minute. But I also mean that other sense of experimental, which relates more to personal experience. The novel is something that draws upon and plays to the personal and even the private. Even, even though there are many novels that are about urban settings and about society and its mores, it, it was always doing this from a very personal point of view, as I'll talk about in a second. Um, th there is a, a private aspect to how novels are both produced and consumed. You might imagine um, uh, poetry, especially uh, epic poetry, and obviously um, anything that's made for the theater, it, these kinds of uh, genres were often very public in, in how they were um, consumed. People would read poetry aloud or the lyrical poetry could even be put to music. But the novel was something which played to being individually consumed and that seemed to match this um, private psychology that became the mainstay of a lot of novels. It very much focused on the, the thought patterns and the perspectives of individual characters more strongly than, say, in uh, traditional theater. In theater, you'd have something like the soliloquy, which would be this formal device by which someone could reveal their inner thinking. But you didn't need that kind of artificial uh, device within the novel because the entirety of the novel was, was well, it didn't always have to be inside the, the person's mind, but that was more of the default position, that uh, we, were, we were an eyewitness 
to the inner thinking of individual characters. All right, so let me talk briefly then about how the novel started to develop certain kinds of genres, both in terms of content and form. Now, in terms of content, a lot of the early 18th century novels were comedies of manners. In other words, they, they um, made very visible the mores and customs of the day. And these often had to do with romance and courtship. There was a lot of them that had to do with tests of chastity. And, and this sort of blend, blended with uh, a concern in the 18th century with moralizing. There was a lot that was very didactic about this kind of uh, literature. It was very explicitly instructing people in, in what they should or what they shouldn't do, sometimes through satire, and, and so indirectly in that manner, but often very overtly. Um, I wanted to say that this, is, this kind of literature is very prosaic, and, and by that I mean that it's, it's every day. The content of, of uh, say, an epic poem would be things that are very lofty and, and you know, epic in their scope. But the, the content of the novel was often very prosaic, very everyday. It could be just um, the life of an everyday person and not of some kind of lord or king or something like that, some great hero. That prosaic nature of the novel lent itself to um, sort of the 18th century counterpart of uh, reality TV. You'd have the true crime novel where you'd see novels that were um, dramatizing the exploits of famous criminals. Um, and you still had travel literature, which had been there for a long time since the Renaissance, but it became more codified and made part of the, the novel structures. So a lot of the, the novels were um, travel-based, um, and of course you can see that coming out of the increased uh, naval presence and the colonization and, and the general empire of the British at this point. Lots of travel going on, so lots of stories about travel. Now, when you start going abroad, you start entertaining not just realism, but, I don't know, what would you call it, surrealism. You have um, fantasy that takes place, because as soon as you get very far abroad, then you can start getting into um, exaggerations and exploiting the imagination. But when I say fantasy, it isn't just like uh, some sort of utopian adventure, although that sort of fantasy element is there in something like Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, where you have these kind of fantasy societies that uh, Gulliver explores. But sometimes the fat fantasy what, or, or that uh, supernatural element was more interior. And so this, especially as we get closer to the 19th century, uh, you start having the thriller or the horror novel. And so we can see that the, the novel will, will shift from a kind of um, everyday reality-based, um, lots of um, very specific descriptions of the, the um, physical environments and the social environments of the contemporary world it shifts from that to, to this um, uh, description of the inner mind and the inner life, which can then play to uh, plots that, that are related to the thriller or to horror, that sort of thing, the gothic novel. All right, now in terms of form, um, <clears throat> the, this very prosaic novel is done in prose. It's not done in poetry. And so it's much more loose. It doesn't have the so much... Um, formality to it, and so there's a general playing with form or a looseness of form. Um, we can also see that, that there's a personal aspect of form. So there are many novels that are epistolary. They are st structured as a series of novel, uh, uh, excuse me, of letters written from one character to another character. Some novels are uh, pretend journals and diaries. Think of Robinson Crusoe, for example. Um, it's important to, to show what form was not there in the novel. It's not dramatic in form. You don't have, while there's dialogue, you don't have um, the direct representation like you have on the theatrical stage. And you also have a different kind of protagonist. You don't have the heroic protagonist. Sometimes you have uh, a criminal, or you just have um, someone from a, uh, a lower class, or, or just people that are not from the upper classes as I said, there's this greater diversity of, of subject matter, and a lot of that comes from, uh, or shows up, I should say, rather as um, different sorts of heroes and heroines um, that, that are even anti-heroes. We also see the emergence of the narrator as a character. I'm thinking of Henry Fielding and, and other um, authors like him, where you have this uh, genteel, often moralizing, 
often humorous uh, narrator who comes in and kind of like a host who's guiding you through the story that he's telling and and uh, is very genial and uh, often very satirical and becomes a kind of character that guides you through the rest of the story. The form can sometimes be um, uh, playing much to long prose. We can have long descriptive passages that vividly realize the material world or the social world of the characters. Sometimes you have the picaresque as a form, which is a series of, of incidents that are loosely connected to one another. Sometimes the form is very experimental. I'm thinking of something like Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern, uh, where you have even the, the fonts in which the, the novel is, is uh, composited um, will vary according to the emphasis that the author wants to make. And you also, generally, this kind of goes back to that narrator, you have a lot of self-awareness about form that, that is there in the, in the novel. Sometimes the, um, the narrator will direct uh, his remarks directly to the reader. Dear reader, and let me reassure you, and things like that. So you have this kind of meta-artistic move with the novel as um, you play with form and then are very self-aware of that form. Okay, so that's it for uh, giving you an overview of the novel genres and of the novel in general in the 18th century. I hope that as you uh, read from novels in the 18th century that you can see connections to these various concepts uh, of um, form and content and also the, the various history and, and culture that is a background for the novel. Thanks.